My friendship with Leela began the day we decided to go up the dark stairs that led, step after step, flight after flight, to the door of Don Achilles apartment. I remember the violet light of the courtyard, the smells of a warm spring evening. The mothers were making dinner. It was time to go home, but we delayed, challenging each other without ever saying a word, testing our courage. For some time, in school and outside of it, that was what we'd been doing. Leela would thrust her hand, and then her whole arm, into the black mouth of a manhole, and I, in turn, immediately did the same, my heart pounding, hoping that the cockroaches wouldn't run over my skin, that the rats wouldn't bite me. Leela climbed up to Signora Spagnoli's ground floor window, and hanging from the iron bar that the clothesline was attached to, swung back and forth, then lowered herself down to the sidewalk, and I immediately did the same, although I was afraid of falling and hurting myself. Leela stuck into her skin the rusted safety pin that she had found on the street somewhere, but kept in her pocket like the gift of a fairy godmother. I watched the metal point as it dug a whitish tunnel into her palm, and then, when she pulled it out and handed it to me, I did the same. At some point she gave me one of her firm looks, eyes narrowed, and headed towards the building where Donna Killy lived. I was frozen with fear. Donna Killy was the ogre of fairy tales, I was absolutely forbidden to go near him, speak to him, look at him, spy on him. I was to act as if neither he nor his family existed. Regarding him, there was in my house, but not only mine, a fear and a hatred whose origin I didn't know. The way my father talked about him, I imagined a huge man, covered with purple boils, violent in spite of the don, which to me suggested a calm authority. He was a being created out of some unidentifiable material, Iron, glass, nettles, but alive, alive, the hot breath steaming from his nose and mouth. I thought that if I merely saw him from a distance, he would drive something sharp and burning into my eyes. So if I was mad enough to approach the door of his house, he would kill me. I waited to see if Leela would have second thoughts and turn back. I knew what she wanted to do. I'd hoped that she would forget about it, but in vain. The street lamps were not yet lighted, nor were the lights on the stairs. From the apartments came irritable voices. To follow Leela, I had to leave the bluish light of the courtyard and enter the back of the doorway. When I finally made up my mind, I saw nothing at first. There was only an odour of old junk and DDT. Then I got used to the darkness and found Leela sitting on the first step of the first flight of stairs. She got up and we began to climb. We kept to the side where the wall was, she two steps ahead, I two steps behind torn between shortening the distance or letting it increase. I can still feel my shoulder inching along the flaking wall and the idea that the steps were very high, higher than those in the building where I lived. I was trembling. Every footfall, every voice was Don Achille creeping up behind us or coming down towards us with a long knife, the kind used for sliping, slicing open a chicken breast. There was an odour of sautéing garlic. Maria, Don Achille's wife, would put me in the pan of boiling oil the children would eat me. He would suck my head the way my father did with mullets. We stopped often, and each time I hoped that Leela would decide to turn back. I was all sweaty. I don't know about her. Every so often she looked up, but I couldn't tell at what. All that was visible was the grey areas of the big windows at every landing. Suddenly the lights came on, but they were faint, dusty, leaving broad zones of shadow full of dangers. We waited to see if it was Don Achille who'd turned the switch on, but we heard nothing, neither footsteps nor the opening or closing of a door. Then Leela continued, and I followed. She thought that what we were doing was just and necessary. I had forgotten every good reason, and certainly was only there because she was. We climbed slowly towards the greatest of our terrors of that time. We went to expose ourselves to fear and interrogate it. At the fourth flight, Leela did something unexpected. She stopped to wait for me, and when I reached her, she gave me her hand. This gesture changed everything between us forever. It was her fault. Not too long before, ten days, a month, who can say? We knew nothing about time in those days. She had treacherously taken my doll and thrown her down into a cellar. Now we were climbing upwards towards fear. Then we had felt obliged to descend quickly into the unknown. Up or down, it seemed to us that we were always going towards something terrible that had existed before us, yet had always been waiting for us, just for us. 
When you haven't been in the world long, it's hard to comprehend what disasters are at the origin of a sense of disaster. Maybe you don't even feel the need to. Adults waiting for tomorrow move in a present behind which is yesterday, or the day before yesterday, or at most last week. They don't want to think about the rest. Children don't know the meaning of yesterday, or the day before yesterday, or even of tomorrow. Everything is this, now. The street is this, the doorway is this, the stairs are this. This is Mama, this is Papa, this is the day, this is the night. I was small, and really my doll knew more than I did. I talked to her and she talked to me. She had a plastic face and plastic hair and plastic eyes. She wore a blue dress that my mother had made for her in a rare moment of happiness, and she was beautiful. Leela's doll, on the other hand, had a cloth body of a yellowish colour filled with sawdust, and she seemed to me ugly and grimy. The two spied on each other. They sized each other up. They were ready to flee into our arms if a storm burst, if there was thunder, if someone bigger and stronger with sharp teeth wanted to snatch them away. We played in the courtyard, but as if we weren't playing together. Leela sat on the ground, on one side of a small barred basement window, I on the other. We liked that place, especially behind the bars where there was a metal grating, and against the grating on the cement ledge between the bars we could arrange the things that belonged to Tina, my doll, and those of Nu, Leela's doll. There we put rocks, bottle tops, little flowers, nails, splinters of glass. I overheard what Leela said to Nu, and repeated it in a low voice to Tina, slightly modified. If she took a bottle top and put it on a doll's head like a hat, I said to mine in dialect, Tina, put on your queen's crown or you'll catch cold. If New played hopscotch in Leela's arm, I soon afterwards made Tina do the same. Still, it never happened that we decided on a game and began playing together. Even that place we chose without explicit agreement. Leela sat down there, and I strolled around, pretending to go somewhere else. Then, as if I'd given it no thought... I too settled next to the cellar window, but on the opposite side. The thing that attracted us most was the old air that came from the cellar, a breath that refreshed us in spring and summer. And then we liked the bars with their spider webs, the darkness and the tight mesh of the grating, that, with reddish rust, curled up on both sides of me and Leela, creating two parallel holes through which we could drop rocks into obscurity and hear the sounds when they hit the bottom. It was all beautiful and frightening then. Through those openings, the darkness might suddenly seize the dolls, who sometimes were safe in our arms, but more often were placed deliberately next to the twisted grating and thus exposed to the cellar's old breath, to its threatening noises, rustling, squeaking, scraping. New and Tina weren't happy. The terrors that we tasted every day were theirs. We didn't trust the light on the stones, on the buildings, on the scrubland behind the neighbourhood, on the people inside and outside their houses. We imagined the dark corners, the feelings repressed but always close to exploding, and to those shadowy mouths, the caverns that opened beyond them under the buildings, we attributed everything that frightened us in the light of day. Don Achille, for example, was not only in his apartment on the top floor, but also down below, a spider among spiders, a rat among rats, a shape that assumed all shapes. I imagined him with his mouth open because of his long animal fangs, his body of glazed stone and poisonous grasses, always ready to pick up and in enormous black bag anything that we dropped through the torn corners of the grate. That bag was fundamental, was a fundamental feature of Don Achille. He always had it, even at home, and into it he put material both living and dead. Leela knew that I had fear. My doll talked about it out loud. And so... On the day we exchanged our dolls for the first time, with no discussion, only looks and gestures, as soon as she had Tina, she pushed her her through the gate and let her fall into the darkness.